So, everyone, uh, welcome to guide number two uh, on Gothic arts for this week. Um, we will be focusing primarily this week on French Gothic arts, which is, you know, the main center in which the Gothic emerged and uh, was dispersed all through Western Europe. Um, but I think there's plenty of information and I'd like to go into some depth uh, in France. And so we'll just focus there. And we'll start with something about the context of the times, I'm trying to show you how some of the ideas that were in work in the Romanesque period and you know, starting with uh, the, the Carolingian and Atonian periods continues to kind of develop uh, during this period. And then of course, after the Gothic period, we'll next week start with early or late kind of Gothic painting and early um, Italian Renaissance painting and show you some of the major shifts that will occur around 1300 or so in Western Europe inaugurating that new style. So with that said, um, let's just talk a little bit about the context. The Gothic, which is a term that was actually applied again by Renaissance uh, thinkers, in particular a man by the name of Giorgio Vasari, who wrote, for lack of a better word, kind of the first um, art historical text on the great Renaissance artist coined the term the Gothic, and he didn't mean it in a good way. He meant to disassociate the turn in the Italian Renaissance towards classical arts away from the preceding Gothic period, which, again, the term Gothic actually refers to the Goths who overran Rome and, by Vasari's um, uh, estimation, led to the Dark Ages. But during the age in which the Gothic arts actually developed, they didn't call it the Gothic, obviously, they called it the modern style or the French style. It starts in an area of France known as the Ile de France, um, which is basically Paris and the areas around Paris. And it, you know, depending on who you're asking at what time, the area around Paris can be like a 30 mile circumference of that area. Uh, and then develops uh, further on from there. One of the big shifts that we see are an intensification of things that we started to see in the Romanesque period is that you start to have um, a really powerful uh, royalty, particularly in France. Uh, during the Romanesque period, the royalty in France compared to the aristocracy, they're almost equals. And we start to see the royalty in France really asserting itself. And one of the ways that it gains power is by building stronger and stronger alliances with the Catholic Church, um, which of course is not just the Pope in Rome, it's, it's all of the monastic orders throughout Europe, so the monasteries and the nunneries, uh, the bishops and so forth. And by drawing ties to the, uh, the clergy, which already had a great deal of power, France is able to kind of buttress its monarchical system. Um, remember as well that during this time period, it's just kind of worth remembering, and this will be important when we get to the Renaissance period, this kind of social system changes. Uh, most of Western Europe is governed by the feudal system in terms of social relations. And I bet some of you remember this, uh, but a refresher is, is, is nice, of course. Um, the feudal system basically starts with the premise that there's a hierarchy in the social order. And at the top of that hierarchy is are the monarchs and the landed aristocracy. Now, every um, part of Europe has a slightly different system, but the basic idea is that the landed aristocracy are people who have inherited um, their rights to the land, their ownership of the land, uh, and that the monarchs, and this really gets going in the medieval period, believe that they have a divine right to rule. And frankly, most of the people believe this as well. Uh, and we'll see some indications of this, where the monarchy believes that they are basically um, uh, ancestors of the Old Testament kings and come from the line, actually, of Mary, Mary the Virgin Mary, uh, and thus they have kind of royal and godly blood that makes them better than other people. 
Now, the monarchs and the landed aristocracy, of course, need people to help kind of govern their lands and protect their lands and to keep the, the, the kind of vast majority of the people in the medieval world in order. And those are the, the serfs or the peasants. And this kind of middle management that helps to um, administer the properties of the landed aristocracy, aristocracy is known as the vassal class. And the vassal class is, you know, one of the most kind of notable of this class are the knights um, who didn't necessarily come from royal lines, although many times they did, uh, who uh, are able to build armies and go on the crusades and keep the peasants in order and protect the king and the aristocracy and also to govern the vast kind of tracts of land that the aristocracy uh, owns. The, the peasant or serf class, of course, are kind of the worker bees in this whole story. And, and the point of this is to say, except for the vassal class, there's kind of no social mobility, particularly for the serf class. You're either born into the social position that you hold, uh, or you, you know, a very few get lucky and enter into the vassal class, and they have some degree of mobility. But the serfs, if you were born a peasant, there's very little opportunity for you to do more than just be a kind of worker bee for the majority of your life. And as we said last time, your goal is basically treating this world as a big testing ground in order to follow the word of Christ and to attain your, your you know, the, the, I guess the payoff of the whole thing is getting into heaven and living in eternity in grace uh, in heaven. Also, um, developing during this time period, um, we have you know new forms of technology just really rapidly expanding. So this is the age in which military uh, technology really advances, the development of large-scale cannons, the crossbow is developed at this time, uh, iron is being put to much greater use than it ever had before because people are uh, understanding how to forge iron and so forth. Um, the other things for us, uh, because we're going to be looking primarily at Gothic cathedrals, are the development of building techniques. And this kind of knowledge, um, you know, can be something as straightforward as learning how to build really uh, secure scaffolding. So it's to put up these giant stone structures using cranes and various forms of uh, leverage, such as, um, you know, a pulley system to to hoist things up, what's called a block and tackle system um, on the one hand. And on the other hand, the technology is the technology of engineering. They start to figure out how to build stronger and stronger, um, primarily composite uh, columns or engaged columns to hold up what is known, known as ribbed groin vaulting. We saw a little bit of groin vaulting in the Romanesque period. Rib groin vaulting, as I'll talk about in a moment, allows the architects to build walls that are no longer entirely load-bearing. I mean, they don't have to carry the weight of anything above them because all of the weight is pushed onto these compound columns um, from the pointed arches that allow these builders to bid, build taller and taller and to open up their walls to what you see on the screen here, which is stained glass, which is, of course, really important in Gothic cathedrals. Further, um, just so we know that <clears throat> these ideas don't come out of the blue when we get to the, the period of the Renaissance, um, advanced form, forms of learning uh, drawn from the classical traditions of classical philosophy, people like Aristotle and Plato, um, really start to enter into the field of theology or you know, people trying to figure out God and, and the whole kind of idea of divine will and what God wants for us and what we're supposed to be doing in this world. And these thinkers, people such as Paul Abelard or Thomas Aquinas, who are some of the most famous uh, of these thinkers, basically take classical philosophy, in particular, they loved Aristotle, who was an empiricist, you know, um, knowing the world, in other words, by observing phenomena. They take Aristotle and to a lesser degree, Plato and Socrates and others, uh, and they use those classical philosophers to rationalize or to explain um, theology, to explain God and faith and religion and so forth. 
And from this develop the first universities at this time, for instance, uh, universities sprout up in Paris, the Sorbonne, uh, in England, at Oxford, and in areas of Italy as well, uh, mainly to teach the aristocratic classes, uh, as well as uh, what we would think of today as scholars. So these forms of learning also start to develop in the late medieval age. Turn now to the main theoretician of the Gothic style, uh, in particular of cathedrals. Um, I want to I want to speak some about what we call the aesthetic philosophy of the Gothic. An aesthetic philosophy is, in a way, the conceptual underpinnings of why they created the way they did, why they chose, in this case, the materials they did, uh, and what all these things were supposed to mean. Now, Abbot Suger, it looks like sugar or something, but his name is pronounced Suger, um, was the bishop of Saint-Denis, looks like Saint Denis, but the French pronounce it Saint-Denis, which is a church kind of on the northern fringes of Paris proper today. And Abbot Suger, um, you know, in the mid uh, 12th century, uh, the, the building that he is best known for is part uh, the, the kind of choir and part of uh, Saint-Denis. Um, he was reading a lot of Thomas Aquinas. He was reading, reading a lot of, um, in particular, a man by the name, of, well, he's known now as Dionysus the Pseudo-Areopagite or Dionysus the, uh, the Pseudo-Dionysus who um, talked a lot about light and light and materials being a manifestation in the material realm, in our realm, in other words, of God. Now, this is a very, what we call Neoplatonic system. And I will go into Neoplatonism more when we get into the Quattrocento in the Renaissance. But just as a kind of brief here, um, Neoplatonism believes that particular things in our material world, the world in which we live, which is oftentimes called the phenomenal realm, are manifestations of the divine, of God in our world. And the most important of these for the late medieval period is light. They believe that light, which uh, you know emanated from God, was God in this world around us, and that any materials that seem to partake of light, seem particularly kind of in, emboldened or illuminated by light, such as gold, uh, jewels, and in particular here, stained glass windows, uh, were closer to God than anything else. And, and so the idea develops that if you're building a cathedral, um, what you want it to do are two basic things. These are the basic premises of the Gothic system. You want that that temple, that cathedral, uh, to point our eyes towards heaven, which means everything in a Gothic cathedral tends to push your eye upward. Think of a pointed arch kind of being an arrow pointing up, or the spires uh, at the top of the towers, or finials, which are little pointed members on the top of the architecture. All of that points your eye up towards heaven. That's one of the kind of easiest things. And so developing cathedrals that allowed for greater and greater elevations, building taller and taller, uh, was something that they all wanted, all of these uh, cathedral builders and all the people who wanted those cathedrals built, along with the fact that, frankly, they're all in competition with each other trying to build the next greatest cathedral for the glory of your town and to God. The other main idea, though, is that you want to open up the cathedral walls to greater and greater degrees of what's called fenestration. Fenestration is just a fancy word for lots of windows. Um, and remember, at this time, they're building out of stone primarily. There are areas above the vaulting system that are all created out of wood to hold up the actual roof which frankly led to a lot of fires, but primarily they're using stone and stone's heavy, right? So when you're in the Romanesque period building these cathedrals, the primary 
mechanism for holding up the cathedral are the walls. The walls are what we call load-bearing. They're strong, sturdy, with buttresses on the outside to hold them up. Uh, and, you know, there are a few places where you can have um, open areas using the, the Roman arch. But really, you know, those walls have to do some work. Uh, and so you can't just fill them up with windows. Big shift, of course, here, and I'll try to explain this in a moment, is using new architectural techniques, including the development of the pointed arch and ribbed groin vaulting, in order to open up the walls, which no longer need to be load-bearing, so that you can place windows in them. Now, this fits into the idea of the aesthetic philosophy because those windows and stained glass becomes a cottage industry, allow for light to penetrate the interior and basically fill the entire uh, space of the church with light as if God is almost in your presence in the interior of these cathedrals. Now, um, a few words about stained glass. As I said before, you know, this isn't an easy technology. They basically mix together silica, sand, uh, with ash and, um, you know, heated it up to molten levels and blew it out into flat sheets. And, uh, and in most cases, especially as the technology develops to give it color, they fuse in that glass various minerals, um, uh, that have, you know, pigmentation to them. Or after the glass is blown and laid out flat, they paint that glass with various mineral concoctions to give it its color and then reheat it so that the mineral fuses with the glass. And then they cut it into pieces and let it, um, you know, in between each of these, you can see here in the picture you have up here, all those black things that you see are pieces of lead that actually hold the glass in place. Uh, and then sometimes at the end, if they need a little bit more detail, they will paint over all of that again with a uh, with these pigments. But a lot of that tends to fade over time if it's not reheated and fused to the glass. In any case, this is a huge industry and creates um, a lot of um, you know jobs for people, as does the building of the cathedral. Now. I'm not going to go into all the ins and outs of building the cathedral in my lecture, but I have provided a link for you that I expect you to look at about, you know, a little bit more information about Gothic cathedrals, but also a video that frankly focuses heavily on how these things were constructed. And so you can get a lot of that information here. So here we see Abbot Sujay, um, you know, donating a stained glass window. It's actually in Saint Denis. He's holding in his hand a stained glass window. And this is what we know as an expiatory offering. <clears throat> it is Abbot Sujet's way. Expiatory just means to expiate one's sins or to wipe away or cleanse oneself. Various forms of creating art or donating art to a church or providing art for the populace were understood as good acts for for um, Catholics and thus put one in higher standing in God's eye. And so he's making sure we all know that he is doing this for the greater benefit of humanity in, you know, in respect to his own theology about Christianity. Oh, um, we see another one of these, and then I'll go into more details about Abbot Sujay's ideas about light. Um, this is Abbot Sujay. You can see him at the bottom. If you follow my cursor down here, he looks like he's kind of floating in space here. Below these two figures, the figure on the left is the angel Gabriel, and the figure on the right is the Virgin Mary. Um, this is the Annunciation that I talked about before. The Annunciation is the time when the angel Gabriel comes to the Virgin Mary. She's about 14 years old and tells her that she's going to bear the Son of God, um, which is the exact moment of the incarnation. And we actually see up above a kind of cloud form up here and a dove meant to be symbolic of the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit of God coming down into Mary um, to incarnate Christ in her. Behind her, you see what looks like a building, and this is important um, for the entire kind of idea of the Catholic cathedral. You notice in France that they're almost all called Notre Dame. Um, Notre Dame uh, 
means literally Our Lady and refers to the Virgin Mary. Now, the Virgin Mary's body was seen as the house of God in the same way that the church is the house of God, in that it hosted the Holy Spirit until it is born into Christ made man. And so a correlation was drawn between the church and the Virgin Mary. And the cult of the Virgin Mary really grows in the late medieval period because of this. She becomes what we call an intercessor or a mediating figure, someone that you can go to and beg for forgiveness and she will be a kind of kindly maternal figure just as the church wanted itself to be known as well. And there is Abbot Sujay at the bottom again, showing his uh, deference and humility before the Virgin Mary, who in a way is a personification of the church itself and of God. The exterior of Saint Denis, this is not part that was built by Abbot Sujay. It was already built at the time that he comes into power. He's going to build the back end of the church, the apse end of the church and change what's known as the choir uh, into this new Gothic system. This should remind you quite a bit, this uh, west facade of a Romanesque church with one small exception, this rose window, as they're called, and I'll talk about this in a moment, um, that gets added, but that's added actually much later. The facade of this was heavily damaged during the French Revolution, one of the parts of the French Revolution is they believed that the Catholic Church was holding too much power and too aligned with the monarchy, and so they outlawed for a brief period the worship of God, and a lot of churches uh, got kind of beat up because of this, actually defaced and so forth. So this is a kind of rebuilt part. The main part of Abbot Sujay's building program, and he called people from all over Europe, engineers and architects and builders, to help him complete this is this area known as the apse or the choir, the area around the altar. And you can see the original plan of the church here, and he's developed this um, in this outer area here. Now what you're seeing is what's called the floor plan. And all these areas here are actually compound piers that hold up groin vaulting um, above it and allow for these areas in between those to be filled with stained glass. Now, the architectural system of the Gothic period is just a development upon the groin vaulting system of the Romanesque period. On the left hand side, you see a groin vault using a Roman arch. Now, the deal with Roman arches is while they are incredibly strong, they're not quite as strong as a pointed arch. So a Roman arch is round at the top, as you see here. And the weight above it presses down on this and is pushed from that center point, that keystone, out onto these, in this case, uh, uh, piers. And all the thrust goes there. Um, when you add these ribs on groin vaulting, all of the weight actually is supported just by these ribs. And the areas in between can be filled in with lighter material, uh, so you don't have as much weight above. And further, with the development of the pointed arch, the thrust is much more efficiently pushed out to the side. So you can build taller and taller, put more and more weight on top of these without the arch actually collapsing. But what you end up needing is something to counter that outward thrust. So think, follow my cursor here. All of the weight gets pushed out here, kind of on a diagonal to the outside part of these compound piers. And what we'll see is the development of greater and greater degrees of buttressing until you finally get what's known as a flying buttress, a detached buttress built up to push the thrust back against this and to support those uh, columns. When you do this, you're able to open up these wide areas known as bays that can be filled with stained glass or just be open walkways. And that is the technological achievement of the, the Gothic period that allows for, again, greater fenestration or windows and greater height in the building of these cathedrals. So if we look down the nave, which is what you see on the left-hand side, towards the choir in the apse end of the church, you can see the use of windows here getting more and more developed. We have a clerestory, 
level up here above with these pointed arches that allows, again, all of the thrust of these ribbed groin bolts up above, all of the weight is pushed onto these compound columns and piers, and it all goes down here so that you can open up these bays on the side aisles. You can create what's known as a triforium uh, filled with uh, windows and this, this area of the clerestory, which allows light into the interior. You can also notice on the apse end of this church and the choir how many windows are here. They're just everywhere, filling the entire uh, interior with light. And I want to point out one thing because it's really hard to see this in photographs, but if you go to these cathedrals, and I should just mention, I lived for a while in France, so I've been to all of these cathedrals. Um, they are filled with these, these kind of incredible um, prismatic colors of light filtering through the windows that dance on the walls of the cathedral and on everyone who walks through there, you're kind of dappled with this light. Why is that important? Well, again, because light is seen as a manifestation of the divine. Light is God in here. And Abbot Suchet starts to talk about the, the church, the cathedral, as what we call a liminal zone in between heaven and earth. It's not entirely on earth and it's not completely in heaven. It's the closest thing to heaven that you can have on earth. And in the present or in the cathedral, you are because you're in the presence of this divine light, you are as close as you can get to the presence of God. And so this is that choir and filled with all these beautiful windows everywhere. I wanted to um, give you a couple of quotes, this longer quote by Abbot Sujay from um, his books on uh, theology to give you a sense of this aesthetic philosophy. So I'll read this over and you can read it more slowly on your own time if you want to return to it. He said, quote, often we contemplate out of sheer affection for the church, our mother, these different ornaments, both new and old. And when we behold how that wonderful cross of St. Eloy, together with smaller ones, and that incomparable or ornament called the crest are placed upon the golden altar, then I say, sighing deeply in my heart, every precious stone was thy covenant covering. Uh, the sardius, the topaz, the jasper, the chrysolite, the emerald. To those who know the properties of precious stones, it becomes evident to their utter astonishment that none is absent from the number of these, with only the exception of the carbuncle, but that they abound most copiously. Thus, when out of my delight in the beauty of the house of God, the lovely, loveliness of the many-colored gems has caused, called me away from the external cares, and worthy meditation has induced me to reflect, transferring that which is material of this world, in other words, to that which is immaterial, meaning God, on the diversity of the sacred virtues. Then it seems to me that I see myself dwelling, as it were, in some strange region of the universe, which neither exists entirely in the slime of the earth nor entirely in the purity of heaven, and that, by the grace of God, I can be transported from this inferior to that higher world in an anagogical manner. Anagogical is a, a fancy term that means kind of um, in between, transported in a godly way to heaven. Now, what he's saying here is that, and, and I need to explain this further, all these precious stones that he's referring to, many of those were ground up to create the pigmentation colors for the actual stained glass windows. Uh, he's saying that uh, these colors and these stones actually partake of the presence of God and by turning them into windows animated by the light. You are basically in the presence of God, or at least as close as you can come to it, on the earthly realm of our uh, phenomenal existence. It goes on to say, and this was inscribed on bronze doors of the church, which have been lost. They were probably taken out during the French Revolution. And just think of them as being somewhat similar to the bronze doors of Bernward, uh, you know, Sir Perdue, beautiful doors. It said, quote, Whoever thou art, if thou seekest to extol the glory of these doors, marvel not at the gold and the expense, but at the craftsmanship of the work. Bright is the noble work, but being nobly bright, the work should brighten the mind so that they may travel through the true lights to the true light where Christ is the true door, meaning Christ is our entry into heaven. He, of course, absolves humanity of 
divine, uh, I'm sorry, of original sin and allows for our ascension to heaven. In what manner it may be inherent in this world, the golden door defines the dull mind rises to truth through that which is material and in seeing this light is resurrected from its former submersion. This is a way of saying that, again, the the church is a conduit or a pathway just as Christ is to heaven and that light or bright materials such as the gilded doors here covered with gold leaf uh, are a manifestation of the divine. So I want to show you a couple of these windows. Um, these windows, for the most part, are uh, basically illustrations from scenes of the Bible or scenes that connect the um, the monarchy of France to its royal lineage, meaning going all the way back to King Solomon and King David and coming through the line of Mary. And so here, um, and I, you know, not going to spend a ton of time on this, in the bottom you see uh, what's known as a nativity scene. The window is called the infancy scene because it shows scenes of the infancy of Christ in which if you've ever seen a Christmas scene, you know the nativity. It's when uh, Mary gives birth to Christ and angels uh, bless him and the wise men, the three magi are up above here coming to visit him to proclaim him king on earth. Uh, we saw this, the Annunciation scene, just to refer to this again, uh, you know, starting off the whole infancy scene. This is uh, Christ coming to earth earth through the the, uh, the Holy Spirit, so God made man, in other words. You have scenes, we won't go into all the ins and outs of this, but think of these as kind of illustrated stories of passages of the Bible that on the one hand are manifestations of the divine because light passes through them and animates them and dances off our bodies, dances off the interior of the church. But they also contain little stories that, um, you know, these are the stories that would have been talked about in the sermons at the time. And people would glance up the windows and see a, a kind of visual confirmation of these stories, such as the life of Moses. Moses parting the Red Sea and uh, leading the uh, Jews out of Egypt and, and those wonderful things. This is what's known as the Sea Window. Um, I'm not going to go into the ins and outs of this, but uh, Tree of Jesse windows are basically kind of visuals that show how the French monarchs in particular can trace their line back through the line of Jesus and back to the earliest of the Old Testament kings, um, King David and King Solomon and ancestors of Jesus. And so you see in these things, and basically it's a it's an illustration that is meant to, um, to, to tell you and to rationalize why the French monarchs uh, have a divine right to rule, um, meaning that God has ordained that they should be at the top of the, the hierarchy in the social order. And, and so you see this kind of visual genealogy using a tree, just as we would say a family tree, in order to trace our genealogies. Um, in order to show how, in this case, you have Jesus at the top with the Holy Spirit above him, and one after another of his descendants leading up to the French monarchs um, uh, proclaiming their divine right to rule. Now, this isn't in your textbook, but boy, there's so much of the stuff that's out there that's so gorgeous that I just wanted to show you these things. Um, this is the chalice of Abbot Suget that was used in Mass. Um, some of you know this, others don't. Um, I will bring this up more and more as it becomes more important. But, uh, you know, one of the, the major sacraments of the Christian church is the sacrament of the Holy Communion. And a sacrament is a kind of sacred ritual um, that renews ties between humanity and God. This sacrament comes from a story uh, of Jesus where at his last supper, his last meal before he is betrayed, a couple of things happen in the story. Number one, Jesus proclaims to his 12 apostles, his closest followers, that one of them will betray him. Um, and the other major thing that happens that starts the whole sacrament of the Holy Communion, uh, or the Eucharistic ceremony, as it's sometimes called, 
is that he changes the bread on the table into his body and the wine on the table into his blood in a process known as transubstantiation and uh, offers this to his closest followers. Now, only the pure, only those who have been, you know, um, uh, cleansed by baptism and have been following uh, the, the word of Christ are able to partake of this ceremony. But it comes from old rituals, kind of ritual sacrifices in a way made now symbolic in which what you're doing is you are bringing Christ into your body kind of literally. You're drinking of his blood and you're eating of his body to bring him literally into yourself. And it becomes the major sacrament of the Catholic Church. Uh, and this is the chalice, just like you might think of the Holy Grail, you know, that original chalice in the Last Supper that Abbot Sujay would have used in his rituals. It's, you know, made out of, again, all gold that shines the light, all of these precious jewels that also partake of the light, this gorgeous crystal work uh, in the chalice itself, all carved crystal, by the way, uh, that also partakes of the light, meaning this thing would have been, you know, with all the candles and chandeliers and so forth, lit up, illuminated as if it were a holy thing. Uh, while he went through the ritual. Isn't that gorgeous? First of the um, fully formed Gothic cathedrals, and as you watch that other video that I have a link to, you'll you'll hear more about this story as Leon Cathedral. They're all Notre Dame de something, meaning Our Lady of, and this one's Notre Dame de Leon, which is a, an area of France. Again, all of these are in France. Uh, Notre Dame de Leon, which was started around 1160 or so and finished around 1210, you can see how long these things took to build, uh, build is kind of the first full Gothic cathedral. It uses the pointed arch, uh, although it's not in super pointed yet. It has this very famous west facade with the what are called portals or doors, always numbering three. You'll see three doors, three windows up above, uh, three different levels, one, two, and three. Uh, three is a very holy number for Christians. It refers to the Trinity. Um, again, those who don't know much about Christianity, you might want to look this up, although I'm not sure it's going to get any less confusing uh, with a, a systematic explanation. Um, for Christians, there is uh, God, the Father. There's the Holy Spirit, which is kind of like God's essence, uh, immaterial in nature. And then there is God made man, uh, meaning Christ, his son. And the three together are known as the Trinity. In a sense, they are all the same thing, but different manifestations, or today we might call them avatars of uh, kind of the Godhead, the, the essence of God. And so the number three turns up over and over again in Christian symbolism. In the center of this, you see a giant rose window, rose windows with tracery now. This tracery is stone, usually supported by iron in the interior allows you to build larger and larger giant round windows. Uh, a rose window is just a round window. Um, it refers symbolically, as most round apertures do, to the eye of God witnessing all things, looking in on us. And on each side, you see what's known. These tall windows with a pointed top are called lancets again. On the top, you see these towers. Uh, everything has a kind of vertical thrust to it. You can see the angles of everything kind of pointing your eye up towards heaven. Gorgeous um, uh, towers at the top have little, um, again, pointed elements here to point you higher. And I just wanted to point out this wonderful little feature. Many cases, these Gothic cathedrals, as most of us know, are filled with gargoyles and kind of demonic looking figures up there. Um, those demonic figures, by the way, gargoyles are what we call apotropaic figures. They're meant to ward off um, evil. In this case, we don't have gargoyles up here. We have mountain goats looking over all things. And these are uh, symbols of our sure-footedness in the face of any kinds of worldly obstacles. If you've ever seen a goat, you know, um, 
a mountain goat in particular, navigate these incredibly treacherous um, cliffs and so forth. Uh, the idea of sure-footedness is what's going on here. Be sure-footed in the face of all the evils that you will be confronted with. And this is just a elevation plan, as it's called, to show you uh, the building technique. It's all one thing built upon another using the Gothic arch. So all the weight of everything above it gets pressed out onto these compound columns or engaged columns and pressed down to another area and pushed out again and so forth. What allows you to do, though, using that rib groin vaulting is to build taller and taller cathedrals. Um, we're looking down the, the nave to back towards the entrance portal. So you can see over here the rose window here with an organ in front of it playing music. That's this on the exterior. Uh, and we're standing roughly in the crossing, so the area uh, at which the transept goes across the nave and looking back towards this area. Now, if you look up at the ceiling, you see these ribbed groin bolts, right? Um, and that's what supports everything. All the way it pushes down here, it gets pushed out onto these compound piers that go down the wall, uh, allowing it to be opened up in the course here known as the triforium. Up above that is the clerestory level. Uh, and then press down onto these giant columns down below that support everything up above it, but allow this interior to be very open. Now, compared to the types of buildings that you know you saw in the Romanesque period, um, this would have seemed really light. And I don't mean just the light coming in from the exterior, but light in the sense of not these huge, heavy walls, but something that was entirely new and light feeling and elegant and things that pointed your eye up towards heaven. Um, by contemporary standards, since we build with steel, um, it doesn't look so light, um, but, but for its time, it really would have been seen this way. The, um, in this case, the, the, the actual top of the nave, so this area, is about 120 feet tall. Remember, this is all built out of carved stone. So that's an amazing feat of engineering. And as we see the, the cathedrals develop, they'll keep getting taller and taller until you know some of the tallest are about 175 feet tall, which is just crazy for building out of hand-hewn stone. Floor plan again. One of the assignments that I'm going to have you do this week is to draw out a, um, a uh, basically an elevation. So not this floor plan, but an elevation and label the parts of the Catholic Church just to cement this in your mind. But remember how this works. This is the entrance wall. This front little area that's usually closed off is called the narthex. You can pick this up in your textbook. So you walk into this kind of in-between realm. And the portal from the, you know, the doorway is the entrance from the mundane well realm of our everyday existence. And the interior of the church is this liminal realm, this in-between realm that Abbot Sujet talked about, you know, not quite heaven, but certainly not of earth. And the narthex's entryway is kind of your transitional zone. Then you go into the nave, which runs all the way down the middle. That's where all the seating is to the transept that runs across. Notice how, once again, it's built upon a cruciform basilican plan. This area in the middle is known as the crossing. On the side are what are known as side aisles. And then you're down into the apt space where the altar is and the major windows are. Just a couple of other views of this to show you, um, you know, the beauty of these interiors and give you some sense of the scale. Now we're looking from the opposite direction from um, the entranceway through uh, the nave down towards the apse end of the church with another giant rose window there. And once again, three lancets here, three being this important number, right in front of the altar where the major ceremonies would take place. Um, this course here, this is just, uh, you know, these are bays towards windows. Notice how the light filters in here. Um, up above is a, uh, uh, a level here that is, um, you know, these kind of what's known as a gallery. A gallery could have seating up here. Um, it could house important people. Up above that is what's known as a triforium. So we have a three-partite system here. 
three. It's called the triforium because usually there's three arches in a row, again, corresponding with this number three being so important, and then above this, a clerestory level with windows. That's a kind of standard way that the elevation of the interior of a church looks. And this is up above, kind of at the triforium level, looking down towards the uh, the entrance wall again. So we're seated in this case in the gallery right above the altar here, looking back towards the entrance wall. One of the most famous of all the Gothic churches, many people consider to be, you know, the perfect epitome of the Gothic style is Notre Dame de Chartres, or Chartres Cathedral as it's oftentimes called. Um, Chartres Cathedral, um, we're looking here at the west facade, uh, the main kind of facade here, actually was built in a couple different time periods. And I'm not going to belabor this point, but it was built at one point, uh, and then a lot of it burned down, which is one of the reasons you have two different kinds of spires here, you know, a, a newer spire here and an older spire here. The old Gothic uh, architects and theoreticians didn't need symmetry. They didn't think there was anything wrong with this. We'll see that that's a big problem in the Renaissance. Everything has to be symmetrical and balanced in the same way. But when it was burned down, they they built uh, part of the, the north facade even taller, even better, uh, and perfected it even more, which is it would developed over about 100 years during this time period. So this is what I want from you. And I don't want you to necessarily copy every component of this, uh, but one of your assignments for this week is to to draw, and you don't have to be an expert draftsman to do this. I, there's not going to be any points off for artistic merit here, but I do want you to get the basic idea of how a church is set up and what the different component parts are. So um, this will be brought up in your prompt for this, but let me just go through the things that I really want you to remember when it comes to a Gothic cathedral. Number one, any face of the church, and there are three major faces, right? This front, usually west facade, uh, uh, and in this case, the south porch and the north porch over here uh, are all called facades. They're faces, and they have major entryways. Doors are known as portals, okay? I want you to know what a rose window is, so a round stained glass window. Obviously, I want you to know what towers are. Pretty easy to understand those. I want you to know that a Gothic cathedral uses pointed arches instead of round-headed arches. I want you to know, in particular, that that pointed arch necessitates the use, and you can barely see it here, and I'll show you more examples of this, of what are known as flying buttresses. Flying buttresses are members of architectural support that are almost like partial arches on the outside, like a groin uh, uh, vault that push back against the outward thrust of these interior pointed groin vaults on the inside. So I want you to know about those as well. I want you to know that, of course, the main uh, areas of the church are the front area, which is known as a narthex, the main kind of longitudinal area here, which is known as the nave, the crossing member, which is known as a transept, the crossing itself, which is known as the crossing. The area on the other side of the transept is known as the choir, where the apse is held. I want you to know that the tall windows are known as lancets. And the rest of this, you know, learn if you want, but I'm not going to be going into this uh, specifically. I also want you to know, though, and this isn't for making your plan, that in this area right here, between the groin vaulting and the actual roof, for a long time to save um, the weight of putting stone up here, this is all built out of wood, which is, if you're wondering how these churches burned, you know, they're filled with oil lamps and candles and so forth, and this whole area is all wood, and that's the part that really gets burning and takes the whole thing down. Once that support goes away and the, the heat kind of heats up these groin, uh, rib groin bolts, the whole thing collapses under its own weight. Looking at that main portal of Shark Cathedral, you see the pointed arch here, you see the number three on the portals or doors. 
Um, the tympanum area, which we talked about before, is the main area of sculpture and in the center of the west portal of Shark Cathedral. Um, what you see is uh, Christ in majesty. So, you know, the Maya Sta figure. He's sitting in a mandorla again, preaching to us, holding the Bible in one hand. He's surrounded by these the, the, these um, symbols of the four evangelists. These are people who spread the word of Christ, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, represented by their animal figures. And I'm not going to make you remember who corresponds with which animal, but you're welcome to look that up if you're of interest, uh, if that's of interest to you. This area that is above um, this area of sculpture here that goes around the tympanum is known as the archibolt. And these areas on the side of the door are known as jams. Just remember it is door jams, right? That are usually various figures here. And I'm just gonna bring you up close on this so you can see some of these things. And there's Christ uh, in his mandorla, surrounded by these symbols of the four evangelists. And in the archibolts, you see um, other uh, figures up here. Don't need to remember those. What's changed from the earlier kind of Romanesque period? Well, at this stage, not a ton. Um, although we are starting to see the figures become more three-dimensional and more naturalistic, right? They look more like real figures, but there's still this kind of emphasis on the decorative patterning of the drapery rather than, um, you know, showing that as real drapery and real folds, uh, you know, in a, a, a kind of more realistic way. Compare, for instance, to San Lothar, Lothar and Hun. It's the same idea, right? Christ is in a mandorla, this kind of body halo, preaching to us. And this one over on San Lothar, remember, it's a last judgment scene. It's not a last judgment over here, but you see how the figure has become a little bit more three-dimensional versus the really flat quality here. And remember what we said last week. The Romanesque sculptors aren't trying to make Christ look human because he's not really human. Uh, he is, uh, at least for them, an idea, God made human. They don't want to emphasize his humanity as much as they want to emphasize the idea of him uh, being this kind of portal to heaven. When we get to the Gothic period, and this just keeps progressing into the, the um, Renaissance period, figures become more and more naturalistic as the world begins to change and we begin to think of this world as more important, more than just a kind of testing ground for us to get into heaven. Uh, and, and that corresponds to kind of world changes, that three-dimensionality of the figure. The right-hand side here, you see Christ incarnation. Um, this is Mary down below. Um, in a kind of nativity scene with figures uh, bearing witness to her birth. This is Christ in the middle being presented at the temple, meaning um, being witnessed as divine. And then up above, you see Mary uh, holding Christ's child in her lap, between her legs flanked by angels in a presentation scene of Christ. This is a literal kind of illustration of the idea that the church and Mary are much the same, that the Catholic cathedral houses the Holy Spirit the same way that Mary housed or bore Christ into this world. Just a close up of that scene. The figures on the archivolts uh, in this case are all Old and New Testament figures. You see these uh, on each side. Just everywhere. So you have scribes writing down words, um, you know, various figures from the Bible. And on the other side, you see um, a scene of the heavenly Christ or his ascension into heaven. So him rising after his death on the cross into heaven and being the king of all of us from heaven. And in the archivolt here, I just brought this in because I think it's really cool. People sometimes look at this and they're like, what the heck are those things? These various animals and so forth. These are signs of the zodiac. And the signs of the zodiac actually correspond, so there will be a sign of the zodiac here. 
uh, and then below it, various labors that people are expected to perform at various times of the year um, in reference to duties uh, pointed to by the Bible itself. And figures of Shark Cathedral look very similar to what we saw in the Romanesque period. They're extremely elongated forms, right, with a lot of uh, stylistic kind of decorative patterning of the um, drapery with just a little bit more naturalism when it comes to the faces than what we would have seen in the Romanesque period. All of these jam figures, by the way, are once again um, figures that uh, come from primarily the Old Testament. They're Old Testament prophets, kings and queens from the Bible, all who are understood to have pointed to the eventual birth of Christ. That's what, you know, the way that Christians understood the Old Testament is as if it were a typology or prefiguration of the New Testament. So all of these figures are considered to be prophets in one way or another of the coming of Christ. Porch, which was one of the newer areas of Chart Cathedral that was built later after it burned down, is even more elaborate. I don't want to go into all the details of this, but I did want to show you a few of these pictures, right? We, we get even deeper um, doorways with a lot more sculpture on the archivolts inside. And uh, you can even see if, if we were going to spend some time on it, because it was done a little bit later, more naturalistic figures starting to uh, look like real bodies uh, in real space. The interior are much the same. Um, the main scene of the center portal on the north porch is a scene in which Christ and the Virgin Mary are sitting in tandem as kind of king and queen in heaven flanked by angels um, uh, as if they were royalty. And they look like very three-dimensional forms compared to what we've seen before. And probably the emphasis on royalty again comes from this uh, Gothic period in which the idea that the king and queen on earth are kind of like Mary and Jesus in heaven, it's really being played up so as to support the idea of the divine right of kings, for instance. You see him, and we're getting even more three-dimensional. Figures look like they have real bodies underneath this drapery. The drapery folds are falling in ways that look more like real drapery would fall rather than just made-up forms. To show you uh, again one of these doorways with a rose window above it. Now, um, you know, as we get further in time, these figures keep getting more and more three dimensional. You don't need to remember who these figures are Isaiah, Jeremiah, Simeon, and John the Baptist, and then finally St. Peter. But I will say this if we were going to spend a lot of time on this, I would say that Isaiah over here is conceived to be one of the first Old Testament prophets to foretell the coming of Christ. I'm sure the Jews didn't think that's what he was saying. But that's the way Christians understand it. And the rest of these figures, Jeremiah and Simeon, are also prophets foretelling the coming of Christ. John the Baptist is the last of the Old Testament figures born before Christ, who is a prophet of the coming of Christ. And then St. Peter here is the first bishop of Rome, uh, or the first pope, as we would call him today, who was literally given the keys of heaven by Christ. And so what we're saying is that, you know, the power of the Catholic Church starts way back there in the Old Testament and comes through the line of Peter, uh, who confers upon uh, the Christian Church um, its power as coming directly from Christ giving St. Peter the keys. Notice how these figures are all getting more and more three-dimensional. Those windows at Star Cathedral and the, the windows in general are phenomenal. If you ever get a chance to go to Chart, uh, please go. It's not a long trip outside of Paris to get there. Um, there are 22,000 square feet of stained glass in Chart Cathedral, over 180 windows, most of which are the original windows created uh, in the, uh, you know, the well, in this case, in the beginning of the 13th century. And so it's a really great place to go see the majesty of these windows. Uh, and we'll just look at a few of these, although I'm not going to go into all the iconography of all these windows. So this is a standard program. Um, the west windows are looking out from where we were just seeing. 
is a uh, rose window, meaning a round window, um, illustrated with various scenes. Uh, in this case, it's a glorification of the Virgin Mary in the center with holy doves up above it and various episodes from her life around it. Down below it is the symbolic number three in the land sets, one, two, three, uh, with the tree of Jesse window down there to show that the, the French kings come from this line of uh, the Virgin Mary, uh, all the way back to King David. Here's one of those tree of Jesse windows. You can always recognize this because, frankly, they have a tree, right? There's the tree coming up and various figures seated between the branches of the tree leading up to Christ. Again, it's the genealogy of the French monarchy here that is in question. Christ up above uh, in his glory with Holy Spirits or doves all around him, symbols of his divinity. This is one of the land sets known famously as Notre Dame de la Belle Verrier, which basically means um, Our Lady of the Beautiful Window. Uh, and it's just a, a presentation of the Virgin Mary seated uh, with the Christ child between her legs there. And we know what that iconography is. Mary houses the Holy Spirit until it becomes Christ made material, God made material, in the same way that the church houses the Holy Spirit during Mass. And these things, by the way, if you're wondering, um, these windows, this one's about 20 feet tall, so fairly big window. The rose windows are about, uh, they go up to about 45 feet across, so massive, massive windows. Here's a Tell you this. Now, a lot of the stylistics have to do with how difficult it is to paint uh, on glass or to create this any kind of naturalism on glass. Uh, but the iconography comes directly out of the Byzantine period, a seated Virgin Mary with the Christ child on her lap. And we'll see more of this uh, when we look at late medieval, early um, Renaissance painting. I will talk about the tradition of Byzantine icon paintings, um, so you'll get a little bit more on that next week. And I, uh, uh, you know, juxtapose these windows with these statements by famous the theologians talking about, again, light as a manifestation of the divine. So Hugh of St. Victor once said, Stained glass windows are the holy scriptures, and since their brilliance lets in the splendor of the true light, meaning God, anytime you see a capitalized letter, by the way, in medieval writing, it's usually referring to God, uh, lets in the splendor of the true light, uh, lets the splendor of the true light, rather, pass into the church, they enlighten those inside. Or uh, William Durandes of um, Med said the glass window in a ch the glass windows in a church are holy scriptures which expel the wind and the rain that is all things hurtful but transmit the light of the true sun that is God into the hearts of the faithful. So the um, in this case the biggest of all the windows the most kind of glorious of the rose windows actually is on the north transept rose window this is the later building of sharp cathedral after it burned down uh, where everything by this time by the way they crop up in just uh, the ile de france so basically you know 25 30 mile um, circumference of paris uh, almost 200 cathedrals during this time, and each one is kind of competing with other cathedrals to be even more beautiful, even more glorious than the one that was built before. And so this window is, as I said before, you know, about 50 feet across. Um, again, symbolic of the eye of God witnessing all things, with a scene in this case of, uh, again, Mary in the center with um, holy doves all around it and these land sets around it, which are Old Testament prophets and kings um, witnessing the whole scene. Getting us in there. Mary holding the child in her lap and these, these glorious windows that, you know, these slides don't do it any justice at all, frankly. Just imagine this thing being, um, Probably for most of you, almost as big as like the facade of your house. You know, it's a giant, giant space. Oh, I'd love to go into this in more detail, but I, it gets a little bit esoteric. Um, one of the land sets 
uh, in this north porch is the story of Charlemagne. Remember Charlemagne from the Carolingian period, kind of the first of the later medieval um, Holy Roman emperors and very, very important to the French monarchs who aspire to be like Charlemagne. Uh, Charlemagne, of course, was famous for um, his military exploits and, uh, you know, uh, uh, solidifying the Catholic Church. He um, is oftentimes in this this window that's called the Song of Roland, um, compared to this famous knight of his, Roland, uh, who went into the Crusades and ended up dying in the Crusades, but he did it following, you know, his calling under God and is glorified in these windows. So in other words, basically what the story of Charlemagne window is telling you is that it's about what we call the active Christian life, a Christian soldier going out to protect us, to spread the word of God, to secure the Holy Land back from the infidels and so forth. And Roland is basically from the vassal class, the middle class, so to speak, um, doing his Lord's beckoning. And that Lord is both Charlemagne as well as God himself. And these are episodic events from that story of Roland. Here you see, for instance, in one of the scenes, Charlemagne sitting astride his horse, remember how that goes all the way back to equestrian monuments that start in Rome, witnessing the building of a church. And of course, now we have one of these cathedrals that's being built and the correspondence should be pretty clear. He's doing this for the greater glory of God and for all of our benefit. I was here for a minute, uh, get a drink of water, you'll notice very little and I'll be right back in a second. Okay, so back to where we were. We're going to move into um, one of my favorite of the Gothic cathedrals. We're going to look at Notre Dame of Paris. <laughs> so Notre Dame de Paris is, um, you know, it's what's known as the high Gothic style. The Gothic style, um, as it's kind of been perfected uh, through the ages, and we're looking at Notre Dame from the standpoint that I first saw it uh, when I was a undergraduate student I took a, a trip to France it was a, a foreign exchange program I was over there for about six months and um, my first experience of this cathedral was just kind of mesmerizing because we had flown in the night before been housed in a kind of shoddy little Parisian hotel and the following morning uh, about 20 of us of the exchange program woke up in a foggy kind of state both from jet lag but also because it was foggy in Paris that day and wandered around the streets of Paris and passed around a corner into this square that's in front of Notre Dame and this is this just came out of blue and it was just so glorious. It's such a huge, beautiful, beautiful Gothic church. I just remember it vividly. I'm not gonna talk about all of the details of this. I just wanted to show you some wonderful pictures and, and, um, and just have you note how it partakes of all of the symbolic ideas that we've seen so far, right? So number one, well, this doesn't have a lot of spires at the top of its columns. You can, or, or the top of its towers, you can see how all of the the um, elements point us upwards towards heaven. Uh, how um, these giant windows, and on the side there are even more of these, let the light of God in. How it has this symbolism of three again, three portals three areas up above this and then another element up here. So three also this way as well. Notre Dame of Paris, um, again, I'm just gonna show you some of these pictures. This is right in the heart of Paris in the Ile de la Cité, the oldest part of Paris and uh, was built on and off over the course of about a hundred years. You see the giant spire in the background there it comes up off the crossing and goes straight up pointing your eye towards heaven. So this element here is a spire and you get a sense of the scale, right? This is the human scale. That's a human being. So think about 
these doors, just the entranceway to the door itself being about 25 feet tall. It's just a mammoth, mammoth structure, all built out of stone and glazing or windows. Looking at one of the sides of Notre Dame de Paris, so you can see on the south portal here, a giant rose window, and above that, another giant rose window, letting the light filter in. Much more vertical emphasis here with all of these kind of pointed elements pointing your eyes up towards heaven. Little indications of flying buttresses here to support the walls of the nave into the area of the choir here. This is the, the transept and the crossing. So this is the choir and the, uh, the apse end uh, over here. I'll show you another example of that. This really, really gives you a sense of flying buttresses, right? So with the development of the pointed arch and uh, ribbed groin vaulting, all of the thrust of everything up above is pushed out this way. And so you need these things, these buttresses that are called flying buttresses because they're detached from the wall. They're not a part of the wall. They're outside of the wall with uh, elements um, that push the thrust, these parts, the flying part, back in place so that the walls don't collapse outwards. You can also see all of the windows all the way across this window, 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 windows all around the uh, choir end to allow the light in. And this is the Seine River um, that runs on both sides of it, by the way. It's a, you know, basic basilican plan, once again. This is the entranceway from the west, the, the narthex here, the nave here, the transept here, which doesn't have elongated ends, so it's not a cruciform plan with the crossing here, the choir end here, the apse over here with a, what's called an ambulatory, an area to walk around the altar behind it, all filled with glass. And this is looking uh, from the uh, gallery level, so this level here, uh, back towards the apse end of the cathedral. And in this case, uh, we have um, the, the height of this is about 140 feet tall. It's huge. Every time you go to cathedrals, you'll probably notice this in a lot of the slides the scaffolding because they're constantly repairing or cleaning uh, these buildings. And sometimes you'll go to see a beautiful cathedral and the entire facade will be covered with scaffolding uh, for years and years while they clean and fix it and hold it in place. You can see a better um, view of the gallery level and how wide it is. This was a huge church, could fit a lot of people. And so this was for um, special patrons to uh, see the 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 mass from that level. And as if you're, again, lying on your back, looking up at this ribbed groin vaulting from the choir and, and all of these windows around it, it's just a, a magnificent space. So to kind of wrap this up with a couple more of these cathedrals, I just wanted to show you how these just keep getting more and more ornate uh, as the years go by and as each one of these um, cities is competing with other cities to, uh, to make their cathedrals even bigger. So this is Notre Dame de Amiens, Amiens, another area of France, another city. Um, by this point, we know the architects' names. I'm not going to make you remember that uh, who these architects were, but um, the way that this building goes, and you'll learn more about this in the video that I've uh, added a link to, is that kind of architects and engineers were the specialized, trained work, uh, people who moved from city to city and, and guarded, frankly, their technology very carefully from one another because this was their means of, of making a living. And then they would hire a lot of the local craftspeople and kind of workers um, to help build these edifices. Sculptors were always specialized labor and they would be brought in from all over the world to create the sculptures for these buildings, almost always all carved out of stone. So again, Amiens Cathedral, climax of the high Gothic, it's getting more and more ornate, meaning there's more and more stuff on the facades. 
uh, all those vertical elements, spires everywhere, little finials pointing your eye to heaven, the pointed arch with, you know, uh, uh, these triangular areas up above it pointing your eyes up towards heaven as well. And a couple of pictures of Amiens Cathedral. And looking down the nave, again, the nave here is about 140 feet tall, so huge cathedral with all the glass at the back end in front of the altar. Basically based upon the same plan again, although unlike Paris, it's got a bigger area uh, for the, the, the choir, um, more area around the altar, what are called episodes that are little kind of private chapels around the back end as well, and a little bit more of a crossing member in the truss. Tra excuse me, transept. Uh, and then, you know, going one step further, Rem Cathedral. Uh, Rem Cathedral is most famous because uh, it is, Rem is the area in which the French monarchs were coronated, were crowned, in other words. And this goes all the way back to the age of Charlemagne uh, as well. Um, and so a lot of the uh, the decoration of this, which I'm just going to show you a couple pieces of, is based upon uh, coronation rituals. So again, we're getting even more ornate here. In this case, because of the use of tracery or the supporting mechanisms for the rose windows, in the area of the tympanum now, we don't have sculpture. We have rose windows placed here. Uh, and all the sculpture takes place in the archibolts and in the door jams around it, as well as the area up above the tympanum here. Another picture of this incredibly ornate Gothic cathedral in Rem. And then just to show you this west facade and its portables, how glorious this is. It's like the entire surface is dissolved into sculpture. And sculptures, you know, run the gambit, everything from ancestors of Christ to um, scenes of uh, Old Testament prophets and kings and queens and the zodiac and so forth. The, the kind of most famous sculpture, though, is right above the central portal here. And close. And what you're seeing is scene in which once uh, Christ is in heaven and once Mary dies, she is assumed into heaven and crowned queen of heaven. So we see Christ crowning her queen with a symbol, the sun, uh, and that divine light, God, in other words, presiding over all things. And this crowning as Mary as queen and Christ as king absolutely is supposed to be a correlative of the French monarchs being crowned in the ceremonies that would have taken place during their coronation. One last point to many, many different sculptors would work on these, um, on these buildings. <clears throat> it's not just one person, it's not just one workshop, many different workshops uh, would help out with this. And if we look at some of these door jam figures, what you're seeing uh, is the entire door to the left and then a close up of a scene down here off to the right, in which what we have is the Annunciation here again. And over here is what's known as the Visitation, where Mary goes to uh, Elizabeth and tells her that she's pregnant and that the, the father is God. And it's a main scene in the Bible. Up uh, close here, I'm just going to get a focus on these ones. You can see the differences between these sculptures. Um, over here, these look a lot more like early medieval sculptures, right? They're a little bit more stylistic. The drapery isn't quite realistic. There's not a lot when it comes to facial features and so forth. There's a little bit more kind of um, maybe we could call this emotion where the angel Gabriel looks happy to be telling Mary and Mary looks a little bit uh, contemplative. But when we get over here to the visitation, this is quite a different type of sculpture. And as many architects have architects, sorry, art historians have pointed out, um, one of the big differences is the pose of these sculptures. So these just look, you can't tell there's a body underneath them. They look pretty stiff and static. And over here, you have what's called the contrapposto pose. This is a characteristic weight shift where it goes all the way back to classical Greek sculptures from, you know, 450, 480 BCE. 
in which all the weight is placed on one standing leg, this leg here and the other leg is slightly bent. You get a little bit of a twist in the body that makes it look more realistic. But it's also a nod back to classical sculptures, which are starting to become more popular in the late medieval period, in this Gothic period here. And, um, and classical works of art will become, of course, the, the big touchstone for artists of the Italian Renaissance in particular. So looking at one side, look at how kind of stiff and static and, and yeah, more naturalistic, for instance, in the uh, Romanesque period, but still looking pretty stylized, still elongated, still no real three-dimensional body underneath them. And when you look at the visitation, look at how different these are. They out from the wall. They're not as elongated as the other forms. If anything, they look a little stunted, like they're not their proportions aren't quite right. And the folds of the drapery look more like realistic drapery. And those draperies, by the way, and I just very briefly wanted to point this out, come from classical sculpture. So there is Mary here, and we see a sculpture of uh, a Roman goddess over here. And notice how the drapery is very similar to what you get in this uh, late Gothic cathedral. And the reason for that is that classical sculptures are starting to become more important. Uh, architects and theologians wanting to decorate their cathedrals will be calling upon sculptors from the area that's now modern day Istanbul, um, the center of the Byzantine Empire, sculptors who know a lot more about classical uh, works of art and are emulating them. Get married. She looks like a Roman sculpture, a uh, portrait of Livia, who was the the wife of Caesar Augustus or Augustus Octavian. And looking in this cathedral, just to show you again some more glorious pictures of this. Uh, in this case, you have a uh, a nave uh, that's about 140 feet tall, with filled with these glorious. Um, rose windows in particular. Finally, um, I wanted to end us off with Saint-Chapelle in Paris. Saint-Chapelle is what's known as the rayonet style, a uh, very courtly style of Gothic cathedral, kind of Gothic taken to its extreme, where the entire building is basically windows. Um, this was a private um, chapel uh, built by Louis the Ninth. Um, who, you know, when you go through the reading, you'll hear about this. One of the things that kind of leads to uh, some starts and stops of the cathedrals is that France is in the so-called Hundred Years' War with England. Um, it's not that they were at war for the full hundred years, but there were episodic wars between the, the French and the English monarchs um, through this time period. And this is built by Louis the Ninth after that, that war is kind of treated to an end. Um, it is a very courtly style. It's his private uh, chapel. It was basically built almost like a giant reliquary. Remember, I talked about these last time. Um, Saint Chapelle actually holds some really important relics, although who knows how real these things are, including uh, the crown of thorns, supposedly, that had a reliquary box built for it that actually cost more to make because of the gold and jewels that are used in it than this entire cathedral, this entire chapel cost. It also had um, uh, the relics of parts of the true cross, um, parts of the iron lance that was used to stab Jesus in the side while he was crucified to hasten his death, uh, the sponge that was used to cleanse him, and a nail from the true cross. Although, again, uh, no way to verify that these things are the real things, but people at this time would have believed them. It's basically 6,500 feet of pure glass, and so when you get inside this, it's a basic basilican plan. What you get is an, down in the crypt area, um, uh, kind of below where the relics are housed, and when you go up, a, up in the area of the altar, what it looks like. It's just windows. All the walls are just windows flooding the interior with that divine light. Very cool. It's, very, it's small in comparison to the other cathedrals we've seen. Here's looking towards the altar wall. <laughs>
now let's move into um, a few scenes of illuminated manuscripts in the Gothic period. Uh, just looking at a few of these to show you that they're out there and to show you, you know, how these things work. Remember that um, illuminated manuscripts are basically luxury items that glorify uh, parts of the Bible uh, for the upper classes. These aren't things that everyone would have. These are basically for the aristocracy. And in this case, in the Bible Moralise or the Moralizing Bible, which was created at the bequest of the French queen of the time, Blanche of Castille, who was uh, the mother of Louis IX, who built Saint-Chapelle. Um, what, we, what we find in this are, um, are parables from the Bible or moralizing tales. In this case, there are about 200 pages of these that are all richly illuminated with gold leaf and, um, and forms of tempera painting. Uh, on top of vellum. And in this kind of starting of the Bibel Moralise, which we believe, well, we actually know, uh, was created by Blanche Castille when she was the queen regent for the young Louis IX. His father had died um, when he was only 12 years old. And so a queen regent is a, a, a queen who holds power until the king is of age to, to take over. She created this to help him be a good ethical king. And here you see her kind of teaching him. This is Blanche of Castille and this is Louis the, the Ninth over here. And down below, we see someone, um, you know, a, a monk with his tonsured head, that's a shaved head, uh, dictating to a scribe um, passages from the Bible that are being written down here and then later would be illuminated with all these these beautiful colors and designs as well. A couple more pages of this. this on the top, you see the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. On one side is the Virgin Mary and on the other side is John the Evangelist. And down below, you see what's called the descent from the cross, uh, cross uh, Christ being taken down off of the cross. The scenes from the Bible that would have been accompanied by verses uh, from the Bible or other moralizing tales on, on the, the kind of facing page here. Again, these are very, very medieval in the way they represent the body. It's all created out of contour lines, very strong contour lines, very little modeling or shading of the form. Figures that should look like um, to you, like uh, painted versions of the types of sculptures you've seen on the cathedrals. Not meant to look realistic, right? They're meant to be the idea. Uh, and just a couple more scenes here. You have a scene that's known as the Noli Me Tangere scene. This is a scene where after Christ is reborn, um, one of the first to recognize him is Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene knows that this is Christ and that he is risen, that he's been re resurrected, which is proof um, that he has power over life and death. And she goes to embrace him. And he says, no, you, you can't embrace me. Noli me tangere means literally don't touch me because I no longer exist in this world. I'm kind of in between this realm and heaven. And down below, you have another scene where Thomas, St. Thomas, uh, doubts that it is Christ. And so he shows Thomas his wound on his side and allows him to touch it to confirm that he has died and has risen. One of my favorite of the illuminated manuscripts of the late Gothic period is the Book of Hours of Jean de Um It's a it's a a scene, and what we're seeing here, by the way, on this is um, is um, uh, the Queen of the time uh, here, who is Blanche of Castille, in the middle of this this letter. Um, so a, a kind of what's called a um, a, a starting page here or a initial page reading the actual um, illuminated manuscript. One of the reasons I like this so much is it's unlike anything that had occurred before. The artist is someone who we know. Um, he was a very famous artist. His name was Jean Poussel. Um, this is uh, a work in which um, what he has done is he's created ink drawings of these 
famous scenes from the book of Bible, a book of hours are scenes from the book of Bible, uh, scenes from the Bible that are keyed into very various dates in the calendar that would have been read by a private patron. And he's created these scenes from the Bible, just like line drawings with a little bit of shading in a technique known as grizz eye. Uh, grizz eye is a term you're going to have to remember. It means painting in gray tones or monochromatic tones. In this case, punctuated by a little bit of color, but primarily gray tones. Later on, they'll use this to mimic sculpture, but it's just a kind of beautiful illustration of these, accompanied by passages from the Bible in Latin here. And in the main scene, you have things like over here on the left-hand side, the betrayal of Christ. So in this story, and everything's in here, uh, Judas Iscariot betrays Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he points out Christ by kissing him. So you see Judas here kissing Christ, and then kind of all hell breaking loose where the Roman soldiers come in and grab Christ, and, and various things in the Bible occur as well. Michel's neck, for instance, gets his ear cut off, which you see happening down here as well. Uh, and over here, you see the Annunciation, where Angel Gabriel is visiting the Virgin Mary and announcing to her that she will um, give birth to the Son of God. Now, notice here how this is taking place in an interior that has Gothic arches, so as to correspond once again the Virgin's body with the church proper, as if, you know, the two are one and the same. What's Cool about this as well is that below these major scenes, we have these little scenes in the margins. These scenes in the margins, which is a, a standard thing to happen in uh, medieval manuscripts, um, have just the, they're so odd. So over here, for instance, you have um, kind of knights, but they're they're ludicrous knights. They're people pretending to be knights jousting or practicing jousting while riding goats. And it's making fun of medieval chivalry in a way or saying this isn't the only pathway to God. Whereas over here you have a scene um, and these are sometimes called drollery. They're meant to be funny uh, and to contrast the high seriousness of the main scene. So drolleries for, for droll meaning funny. Uh, everyday genre scenes. In this case, um, they're playing a game that apparently is still played today called Froggy in the Middle, where someone sits in the middle of a, a band of other people and tries to reach out to them while sitting cross-legged while everyone else tempts them to reach out to them. It's just kind of a kid's game. And notice I should have said this. Now that's how these figures, again, she's using kind of a contrapposto pose. We've got another contrapposto pose here. Jean Poussel clearly was, uh, had great knowledge of classical works of art when he created these. I just want to show you a few more scenes of this. So, um, I'm sorry, and earlier I said this was uh, related to Blanche of Castilla. I, I, that was my mistake. This was created for Jean Devereux, obviously. It's her book of hours, uh, a famous queen. So in this scene, for instance, you have Christ carrying the cross over here all painted in grisaille with only blue in the background. You may be able to see this here. That little design in the background is what's called a fleur-de-lis. Fleur-de-lis is a stylized lily that is a symbol of uh, the kings of France. So it's associated with the kings and queens of France. Uh, and then over here, you have a scene of an annunciation to the shepherds kind of minor scene in the Bible that tells the shepherds that Christ has been born. And in the nativity scene, of course, the shepherds come to visit the Christ child. There's a close up of Christ carrying the cross. Again, beautiful, elegant, very classical um, illustrations in this book. And scene of Christ before Pontius Pilate Remember this um, from last week, that Pontius Pilate was the magistrate in Jerusalem at the time of the execution of Christ, who gives the, um, the decision to the Jews who condemn Christ to his death, and he's sitting here um, kind of absolving himself. And finally, from the Book of Hours of John Devereux, a lamentation scene. Lamentation scenes, which you'll see a lot of, are after Christ has died in his crucifixion, he is 
um, surrounded by his closest followers who lament his death. And that's what we see happening here. Almost always the person who's closest to Christ is the Virgin Mary. You see her trying to embrace him. And the second closest is um, his closest apostle. That's John the Evangelist here. And we'll wrap this lecture up with um, with a, a sculpture. This is the sculpture of the Virgin uh, Mary created by uh, Jean Devereux, uh, created out of silver. It's solid silver. It's about 27, well, not solid. It's, it's cast silver, so it's got a hollow, but it's very heavy silver that is cast in the sear pear view process again and then gilded, so covered with gold leaf here. And it's just a scene of the presentation of the Christ child and the Virgin Mary uh, here. It's actually a reliquary, believe it or not. There's a place in the back of her head, just like the sculpture you saw last week, that held uh, pieces of the Virgin Mary's hair, supposedly. So this is a, a reliquary. Uh, remember, those relics are... Um, um, they're divine, right? So they are, they're holy items that, that have various um, boxes, or in this case, sculptures, to house them. Come out of this medieval tradition of Byzantine icon painting that we'll go into next week, um, but getting more and more realistic. This one's certainly based upon classical sculptures with its contrapposto pose and its greater degree of naturalism. But the subject matter has remained the same all the way back to about the seventh century um, in these Byzantine icons, which you see on the left-hand side here. So, uh, thank you for listening. Now move on to the linked lecture uh, or linked uh, video from YouTube on the construction of the Gothic Cathedral. And I'll see you next week when we start off with late Gothic painting and early Renaissance painting.